والتر نش ریشرهدو ده کورال اتماس ایگور ل ایرگرید به میسی ل دین کالول اون کومن لو کلاس گیل اگه ستا سولیگم کومنی شیف تنی باش I remember saying to him, this is some trip, Sean Murray. This is unbelievable <laughs> shit. He says, he says well, it's not a trip, Muggsy, it's, it's a tour. And I was like, no, but you know what I mean? He says, no, I don't. So proud there again, D&G. Hoor da, hoor da again, D&G. Dalsin Cavana. Yeah, it's L&G anyway, Larry and Galvin anyway. That's the, that's the brand name anyway. This season, the show is brought to you by Airgrid. They're the proud sponsors of the Under-20 All-Ireland Football Championship. Not only is Airgrid delivering a cleaner energy future for Ireland, they are invested in development of our most promising GA players and the managers that helped them to shine. Welcome back for another episode of this season's Coral Le Tomas in association with Airgrid. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by my good friend, Dr. Con Murphy. Off air, Con, we were speaking about another one of our recent guests, Eamon McGee. You told me you had a lovely story about him, Con. He, the last time we played on the goal, he... He was a sub. I don't know if he came on or not, but I met him after the match. We were sitting around looking at the next match and I asked him, did you want to swap jerseys? He said, no problem. I gave him a Cork Blood sub jersey and he gave me his Donegal jersey. So sometime I meet him, I'll hand it back to him. I didn't realise it was going to be his last day. It was his last game, was it? I think so. So Yeah, is that a valuable jersey? I'd give it, I'd give it back to him. I, I'm looking, I'm always fascinated when I go into your house, Con, and I can see pictures, I can see Sigerson pictures and Cork pictures in the background. You have a fierce interest in photographs and you have an awful collection of photographs gathered over the years. You love taking photos. I do. Um, it's hard to believe, sir, when I started with Cork in 76, we won three in a row. We had no photograph of it. Not one, not once did we put the whole lot together and take them. So that was a big disappointment. The other thing was, I sat beside Christy Ring for every match in the three years, and I've no photograph of it. And that yeah. time, RTE didn't focus on the dugout, so <laughs> I have no record of it, which is disappointing. Well, how did you find, and yeah, I called over a few times, John, how did you find, like the rest of us, lockdown was tough, Con, but for somebody like you who was socially like you were in the fucking clinic for years you were uh, mixing with teams all sorts of football hurling all down you found lockdown in terms of missing the sport and missing the interaction tough enough i found it terrible to be honest with you uh, i kept warning people before it it started that they get depressed out of it I, little did i know i was talking about myself it wrecked my head uh, I missed everyone. You you were meeting no one. That was the biggest problem. Uh, there was no events on. Uh, training wasn't a, a, a feature. Uh, no matches. It was terrible. So it, it, it did affect me badly. But I'm over that now. I'm, I'm grinding. Are you getting back down to training? Because I know you'll never, you'll never not go to Cork training. And I can imagine down the years coming close to championship, which which Cork are in the middle of a, a, in both at at the moment. You love going down to the, the summer evenings, the warm hot days, and the clash of the ash and the crack and the and the banter. You're back going back to training, are you? I am. Oh, I've been back all the time hurling and football. It's great fun. We even had a match with when college had a match the other night, a challenge match, getting ready for the championship. So it's just all. St- all systems go. Anybody that mentions Dr. Connor, it is always associated. Two things will always jump out. People that know you will know that you have a fierce connection with UCC. We'll come to that in a while. And they'll always connect you with, with Cork, obviously, being the Cork team doctor. But talking to you down the years, and I don't think people have really tapped into it or they don't know. It's not that they haven't tapped into it. The history of your dad and his own history in terms of Cork football and Munster Railway Cup but it's it's and I love talking to you about it. It's the the background he has from the Beira Peninsula. You tell me about his youth, about how he played below what club, how he came up through the ranks, how he played with Cork, and a little bit about that kind. Yeah, he played with Bear Island. Interestingly, Bear Island is in the diocese of Kerry, so he went to Brendan's Killarney where he played football, obviously. So he played with Bear Island and Beira, winning a county championship with Beira. Um, 
Then he got on the Cork team about 1942. So he was he played full back for Cork for over 10 years uh, and played Railway Cup. He was great friends with Joe Keohan and Paddy Bond. What was funny about that, both, of the, both Joe and my dad wanted to play a full back. So John Joyce, he being the diplomat he was, the arrangement he came to was whichever one of them won the Munster final got to play full back. So that was the deal they had. But what was amazing, say, there was no electricity on Bear Island in, in, in that era. Uh, and my father used to row out with his brother, Brendan, who was on and off the car team, to the mainland in a four-hour boat. Do you cycle to Bantry? The county board used to give him a taxi to Bantry to Cork and they got the train to Dublin. And obviously they did the reverse coming back, except that my grandfather, who was known as Pop, lit a bush for them coming in so they could find where they were going. Rowing back into the island that they'd know where to, your man would have yeah. a, your granddad would have a, a bush lit for the boys coming back in. So as they know where to go. You talk, about, when you, when you, you, talk about strength, you talk about strength and conditioning, you wouldn't need much after that. <laughs> How far a cycle from Bear Island into, into Bantry? Oh, I say it's about 35 miles. So, And how far is it a row in? Oh, gee, it would take you two miles, I'd say. Two miles of a row in, 30 miles yeah. on a bicycle, taxi into Cork and a train up to... To Dublin, <laughs> they go a bit, you know, with somebody above. The match was the easy part. <laughs> when you compare it to nowadays, Con, you've seen the whole lot. Say, when when then did G move to the city, Con? Uh, my my father went into practice in Cork City as a vet in 1947, and he was the vet to the dog track as well. Uh, oh, he became chairman of the Cork County Board from 56 to 66. Uh, 1970, he became chairman of the Munster Council, uh, but vice president of the GA, so I'd say he's probably heading for the big time. Uh, but unfortunately, he dropped dead above 54 years of age at Limerick in 1973, which was a huge right, shock for us. Young, yeah. Yeah. And would you have gone to a lot of the games with him? Would you have gone... Say, would you have remembered him playing or anything like that? Um, the first match, and probably his last match, was 1955 county final with Lees. He was full forward, uh, and they won. They beat McCroom. So and you can that remember that? Me. I can remember that. Where was that played, Con, then? That was down in the... It was played in the old athletic grounds. Yeah. And I I would have been at the 56 and 57 all Ireland football finals, and the dog was sort of mascot. Uh, and my simple what was friend. the geez back in 57 what was the big difference like uh, compared there was no comparison in terms of the, the, the way I suppose everybody says teams are treated the way they are nowadays and that everything is professional what was the biggest difference in your eyes back then I, I remember I remember after training they used to get milk and sandwiches some nights and I remember listening to a recording of the other All Ireland semi final in 1957 to get to get a feel of what the other team were like. Which was a recording you were listening to. Uh, <laughs> what I remember about Co Park then was my dad seemed to know everyone, and he was getting his friends in through the sideline. <laughs> so the crowds were huge. You wouldn't you wouldn't pull that off today, but. What do you um, mean? The, the, the preparation, Con, in terms of, of Cork and your dad's training, did they train twice a week? Did they train three times a week or did they come together? I know Kerry used to come together collectively in the 30s and the 40s where they'd have these kind of training camps. But that wasn't because they were trying to get extra training in. It was the only time they had training. I only remember them training twice a week. There was certainly no team talks <laughs> or videos. You know, It was very simple. I mean, when I started with Cork in 76, we only trained about three weeks before the championship, which was knockout. Luckily, in my first three years, we, we won, won three All-Irelands. But compared to what we do today, there's no comparison. Yeah. Did you mention the Lees, and I asked you about this before, because 
they don't exist anymore. But that was a club. Tell, explain to us who the Lees are and where they were. And and they were they were one of the first clubs in Cork, and then they disbanded. And in 1953, my father and a few friends reformed them. Uh, the reason for reforming them was that the travel was poor that time and people worked a six day a week. So you had a lot of people in Cork who couldn't get home on the weekend to play a match, including my dad. So when they won the county final in 55, Mick Cal from Tip was centre forward. My father was full forward. The midfield they had was the the Roscommon midfield, Eamon O'Donoghue and another fella. So they were like the college, uh, but they had no area. Uh, and when I was growing up, I played underage with Lees, but by the time I got to college, they were gone. Okay. So when I came out of college, I had no club. I stayed with UCC. Yeah, that's your connection with UCC and you yeah, forever. I have Forever with them, yeah. What does UCC mean to you now, Con? Because I've everything I've been involved with. Uh, I've I've been involved that often now, but I got involved with a fresher team because of you. Got involved with a cigar team because of yourself and Billy. Um, what does the UCC like mean to you? It's great fun. Uh, plus, you're meeting fellas from other counties, uh, and you're helping develop players. I mean, Billy. Now I got Billy in ten years ago. A few weeks ago there, Cork and Kerry were both playing on the same weekend. 25, 25 players in the Turkey had played with UCC. Hunter Billy. Phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an outstanding contribution that isn't really recognised. He but has, he has he's, some he's connection. He's done a great job. Yeah. yeah he, he's the and they love him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Do you you would have a hand, an active hand still in all areas of the UCC in the football club in particular there? But you you were you were um, you got party down there to train them uh, a long time ago as well. Tell me about oh, what kind of an experience was that? <laughs> oh, we great fun! My God, we didn't win or we we didn't win win around the Sigerson. I always remember the, the second year we lost to St. Mary's up in Belfast and we were coming down the bus with the team. We were coming into Dublin and Paddy and myself were getting out. Paddy was going out to see Charlie. So I said, Paddy, this is the last time with the team. Stand up and thank them for all they've done for us and wish them well. So bus pulled up. He threw his bag. I got out after him. He turned around to me and he said, "Are oh, fuck him. He says, they left me down. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> well, yeah. there but was, I, um, I tell you, I had some crack with him. He, he, he was great. I enjoyed it. And it was, I say, stories down the years. In terms of UCC, Con, and I know that you have, like, air greater the sponsors here and there, trying to manage the energy throughout the whole country in terms of power and all that. Young fellas and burnout, and you see it all around you. And I've seen you speaking about it in terms of fellas getting, uh, how they can keep it going, how they have the hunger for it, how they're not getting picking up injuries. You've seen it firsthand. Do you think it's madness at times what's happening, especially to the 19 to 24 or 5 year olds? I do. And I think you'll see a big change now when, when, when the whole COVID thing is over. In fact, I go further, we've had, and, and this applies around the country, there's a way more injuries at the moment than there was two years ago. And I put that down to the, the COVID. You see, before you came through the winter in a soft ground, but this time we came back onto concrete and the amount of hamstrings is frightening. And it has to have to, to do with the COVID situation, not COVID itself, but the fact that we have been unable to train properly through the winter. Yeah, down the like, do you think with a split season with a club and the county, do you think the inter county season is too long? 
Do you think that we're training players too often, too much, too... Like, I don't know, you've seen it all. You've, you've been through the 50s, the 60s. You got involved in Cork with the 70s in terms... You've been involved in, in inter-county teams from 70s, 80s, 90s, six or seven decades now. And do you think for an amateur organisation, are we gone too far without... And you're not... Look, it's just the way it is. Every team are doing it. Are I we absolutely, too far one side? I absolutely agree. They're doing too much altogether. It's almost full time for them. And what you'll see, Tomas, and this weekend bears it out, there's only very few of us can win the All-Ireland. I mean, it's becoming less and less. You, you, you'll never have a Seamus Darby moment on Crow Park again where a, a complete underdog sneaks up and, and, and wins the All-Ireland, which was great, but it won't happen. The stronger getting stronger and the weaker getting weaker. And I think you'll have to make a decent competition for the weaker counties. The interprovincial system is not working. I mean, Leinster is not working. Uh, Ulster is the only province where it seems to work. So I think they have to change the whole format. Yeah. Less is more, I think, my own opinion is. Less is more. Yeah. Down the years, Con, and I suppose just talking from a medical point of view, what you've come across desperate situations, I would say, in terms of injuries. And, uh, like, I, I love the story you have. Do you ever save any fella's life on the pitch? And you and you were asked that at a, at a medical conference once, were you? Oh. <laughs> say, my, 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 my job with, with Cork was to mine... Well, to sit with Billy and try and keep him weight. But 87, we lost to Mead. 88, uh, I've cried twice in the dressing room. Um, I cried, with, say, we went for four in a row with the hurlers in 79. And I was stitching John Horgan afterwards, who was the captain. And he was crying and I was crying. It wasn't that we'd lost the four in a row or were beaten, but we all knew it was the end of an era that that was the break up of the team, which it was. And that was it. But in 88, we, we, we were three points up with Mead and uh, the Kerry Man ref in it, if you remember. <laughs> tell, tell me some sure. group. Somebody dying there will never understand how that happened. But anyway, he kept it going until he drew it with a dodgy kind of free at the end. Right. So I was sitting beside Billy. <laughs> Billy was first up out of his seat, tearing across the field. I had a fair idea where he was going. <laughs> and at the last second, I caught him and pulled him back. And we were at the front of the examiner the following day, co Dr. Consol's coach. <laughs> <laughs> so we lost the replay, but the, the next year we played Mayo and I got a bad fright. After 20 minutes, the Mayo foot forward got knocked out cold. And he was so bad, the car fellas came over to my dugout and pulled me out to help the Mayo fellas. And the chap had swallowed his tongue and he was out cold. My my first thought was, Jesus, is this the one day we might win? They're going to abandon it. But <laughs> uh, all the talk the following day was about saving his life. You know, Pat Kenny was on about it and it was all over the papers. And a few weeks later, <laughs> I was in Killarney at a conference. And after I spoke, I'd seen Tommy Sugu run in. But a fellow from Guinea Gilla stood up and he says that. Uh, uh, Dr. Cron, uh, we saw you save a man's life there in Crow Park a few weeks ago. <laughs> I said, the only man's life I ever saved in Crow Park was Tommy Suguru. But that was done. <laughs> <laughs> Down the years, Con, with the managers that you 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 spoke about, Christy Ring, and you spoke about Billy, who are the real, uh, the canon, uh, who was the, the, in charge of the hurlers? All the great managers they down the years that Cork have had, and that you've heard them inside in dress rooms. You have some wealth of, and I say you have experienced some huge days, momentous days, sad days inside in Cork dressing rooms down the years. I have, 
I heard Mick O'Dwyer a few times as well, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> he, used to, he used to love to see Mick coming in the door saying that you were the second best team in, in, in Ireland. Oh, God. <laughs> Poor old Billy used to go bananas when he'd say that. <laughs> but I heard Mick O'Dwyer in, in Dublin. All I remember the Mick O'Dwyer saying is leave the ball into the bomber. <laughs> that, that was their tactics. <laughs> but, who were the, I, I was the, working. Go on. I was working out that the uh, someone asked me about doctors running on the pitch and that. I mean, it, it's crazy the amount of running in of physios and everyone today. But I was on my tenth visit with Cork before I came in in the field of play. And in fact, my first time coming on the field of play to an injury was Tim Kennelly got split towards the end of the 76 final when Brian Mullen scored the goal. That was my first time coming on the pitch. Now, what that was day, the... the same day, Polly Manny tore his Achilles tendon. I said to Polly, what happened to you? He said, some fella from Hill 16 has thrown a rock at me, but it was his tendon had snapped. Jeez, it was some... Down the year, you told me lately that the amount of injuries back then compared to the amount of injuries, you wouldn't see a cruise ship for years back in the 70s or the 80s, and now you'd see them every second week. I tell you, this is this is actual fact. Uh, from 76 to 80, 82, uh, I would have seen every car hurler and footballer and indeed carry footballer, right? Pat Plan came up to my house one night with his knee in trouble. I brought him out to the CUH. They brought him in. They opened up his knee. There was no keyhole stuff that time. And I called out to see him the following night, and he was crying. And I said, what's wrong? They said, I'll never play again. And I said, what's, what, what, what injury have you? He said, it's my cruciate. And to be honest with you, <laughs> I'd barely heard of it. So he went home to Temple No, convinced his career was over. And he got on to his uncle, Cannon Line in Glasgow Celtic, and told him what happened to him. And he checked it out over there and found George Burley of Ipswich Town had his crusades repaired by David J. Dandy in Cambridge. And I wrote to Mr. Dandy and Pat headed over to Mr. Dandy in Cambridge, and that was the start of an epidemic. <laughs> that was the first one you know, that I ever that heard. Happened? 82. 82? Yeah. What do you think is the reason yeah. for so many of those injuries now? Is it the type of training? Is it the amount of training? Is it the strength of players now? Is it players doing their own thing and not doing it right? What, what do you think it is? Well, first of all, I think we have to acknowledge that we probably missed them before. Yeah. And nowadays they're very easily diagnosed with um, ever. You see, the modern player, no matter what happens to him, he wants an MRI. Yeah. Right? I, I, I give you the difference in how players approach injuries. In in 1981, Mikey Sheehy and Joe Kuan arrived up to my house at 7 o'clock on a Friday night before an All-Ireland final. And Mikey had a sore foot and he couldn't kick the ball. No x-rays, nothing. So we went out to the Mardike and I injected his foot. And we had no ball. I found a rugby ball. And Mikey practised taking freeze with the rugby ball. And he played in the All-Ireland final. Two days later, I injected him again. Right? Yeah. The following week, he played for Aston Stacks in the county final they were beaten. And then he rang me on the Monday to say he couldn't walk. Jesus. And so then we got him x ray to find he'd broken a bone in his foot. No, that wouldn't happen today because every player would have an MRI and he'd be placed in the boot and he'd... no chance of playing. That time, fellas wanted to play at all costs. But that's not the approach today. To, to give you an idea how different the, the whole attitude to training and injuries was, uh, 1980, Ger Power was captain of Kerry. And a week before the final, 
he rang me in a Sunday night to say he made bits of his hamstring. And he came up and stayed with my mother for the week. And got physio twice a day from Francis Walsh, who was considered the guru of her time in the CVH and um, hamstrings. And on the Friday, we went out to the dike for a fitness test. Now, he was captain of Kerry, but nobody from Kerry turned up at the test. So it was just myself and Pori. And Pori said to me, look, he said, I don't care what you do, but I have to start. I don't get the cup if I don't start. So he started running. I said, you're wrecked. You're you can't go. You can't play like that. He said, what about an injection? I said, they don't really work for hamstrings. Well, try it, he says, because I don't care if I never play again once I play a Sunday. I gave him an injection. He took he took one or two runs and he said, geez, that's magic. I went up to the dressing room the day of the match. Mick up. So that's what you think. I said, he won't last. We start from so, he says. And... Uh, he lasted 20 minutes. He kicked a point, and at half time, I told Miko he was gone. Miko said, Could you inject him again? I said, No. So, if, if you could recall that match, Mikey scored a goal before half time. <laughs> I was inside in the toilet when Mikey arrived in. And I said, Great goal there, Mikey. What goal? I said, uh, That goal you got there before half time. Jesus Christ, blank look on his face. So I went out and I called Mick Gaw and he says, what is it now? <laughs> You're getting fed up with me. I said, uh, Mikey don't remember scoring the goal. Oh, tell him not to worry. He said, we'll short him tomorrow. <laughs> so that, uh, that was our concussion problem at that time. <laughs> a lot of people wouldn't know that you were actually doctor for the Kerry team for a good while. Well, not a good while. For a few, for a, uh, a couple of years. Yeah, that's because I was friends with the lads. And sports injuries, you must remember, like, in that time, sports injuries wasn't an entity, you know. There were no clinics, there were no... Say, you take the size of Trelino and Kerry. When I worked in Kerry for a year in 1976, an orthopaedic surgeon visited every three weeks from Cork. That was the sum total of cover for orthopedics and Kerry. I mean, how different it is today now. Yeah. Do you know, the? I was just thinking there, Con, down the years, and I travelled on a trip with you abroad with the Aussie rules in 2005. We went to Australia. It was a brilliant trip. Down the years with Cork, with Ireland, with you've seen the world basically like. And was that, did you get as much of a kick out of that, did you enjoy those trips? Did you enjoy the social side of it? What, what? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I thought the Aussie rules was brilliant. I mean, I think one of the pities is you don't get a chance to meet players from other counties. What? You know, there's not a social element to the GAA. Uh, but with the Aussie rules, we great fun. Jesus. I remember. It's I remember a, out in the 2005 trip, we had a match and. Uh, I went in, we all went in, we had, we had a function afterwards downtown, and then I was inside in a bar with you at some stage, and we came out, and we were going home, well, I, I had a, an idea in my head, we came out, and the sun was shining, we got a desperate fright, and we jumped into a taxi, and I dropped you off the hotel, and, and I was staying in the taxi, and you said, where are you going? And I said, I have to meet a man about a dog. <laughs> I, was going, I was going back out and you were going in would you mind us on that trip as well Cork saw the world as well Con with all the with all the All-Irelands I presume you went on lots of trips and the crack and the banter with all the lads was mighty they were great the, one of the best ones was the Cork Hurlers and the Kerry Footballers were on the same All-Star trip one year that was some fun but you, you're talking about that trip to Australia do you remember Colin was with us on that trip uh, and the first the first match, he called me and he said he double vision. <laughs> concussion. He couldn't get. He, he couldn't play if there was concussion. And I, I remember uh, being there. I said, Gooch, you do realize you have to get fucking hit to actually get concussion. You know that. Gooch, <laughs> Gooch never went near the ball out there. I do remember. 
I do remember when he was going out that he was being touted as the best. He was the top footballer in Ireland at the time in Gaelic games. But that time, Aussie rules, Chris Johnson, I don't know if you remember it, but Chris Johnson did wreck in a game out there. He cleaved uh, Jordan from Tyrone and uh, Philly Jordan. Geez, he, he cut him in half. And there was a desperate bad feeling after that game and the injuries. But I think it was around that time when Chris Johnson cut loose that Gooch got the concussion, was it? Twas, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I tell you, he was a good tourist. <laughs> oh, he was a great tourist. He was. Bomber, fun. His bomber always said he used to get out. It was the only time that we were actually professional. Bomber used to get out of the bed on those tours. And he'd, it'd be during the off-season and he'd be patting the big belly and he'd say, Ah, oh, an international athlete. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the characters you've met down the years, Con. Moss Keane, I always remember you spoke about him, and he was a big UCC man as well. But back then there was a big thing. He was a huge GA man, wasn't he? Oh, he was. He played for back for UCC. He captained us to win a Sigerson, played in county championships. Um, I don't know if I should tell this story, but... Tell it away. In 19... 19- 1973, my last year in college, we were, we were playing the county semi final, and Moss was full back. Um, it would be fair to say he wasn't a brilliant Gaelic player. Uh, but this night, we were playing St. Michael's in the semi final, and he's getting the run around, and he threw a haymaker at a fellow called Neely Keith, and he took a dive. Now, Moss missed him, but he got put off. And the game turned after that. <laughs> we won. We won with fourteen men. <laughs> the same night, I was working in Norton Infirmary. Mass came up with me afterwards, and a few fellas. He put on a white coat and went up in the ward, skinned the patient's whiskey, <laughs> and he cost me my job. But. We were going to play in Carberry in the, in the county final, and I, I was one of the fellas picking the team. And Declan Barron, who was the top forward of a, in Cork at the time, was playing for the forward for Carberry. But Neely Keefe, to his credit, rang me and he said he'd give evidence to say that he took a dive on against Maskey. And I said, if you don't mind, we prefer you didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mass was so popular and so loved, there would be no question of dropping him. So, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was done for that. But he, he, he was very witty. I I texted him after Tyrone beat Kerry in, 19, in 2008. Very disappointing. And he immediately texted me back. He says, There's only one S in disappointing. <laughs> 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 I play golf for them once as well. The characters, can if you uh, two names jump out at me in car curling down the years that I've I've lived down here long enough now, JBM and Christy Ring, the two of them, and there was an iconic in back in uh, parties pub. You have JBM wearing a, a a bars jersey, an old bars jersey from the great bars teams at that time, and ring in a suit and the two of them chatting I'd love to know what they were chatting about but I'd say during that time ring around the place did ring have an aura about him that time in terms of oh, you know that they were well like I mean I, I mean I used to go out of my way to sit beside him because I was so much in awe of him but he didn't say much in the dressing room and he always wore his best suit and shirt and tie but before we left the dressing room, he'd stand at the dressing room door and he'd hold up a hurley and hold up his other hand. And he said, remember, lads, we're from Cork. Yeah. No, there wouldn't be much point in me saying that. But <laughs> when Christy Ring said it, by everyone listened, you know. Yeah, it was phenomenal. Like, and was. JBM, what was JBM like inside the dressing room? Because JBM has all the Cork supporters they love. It's just something about him. Like you drive around Cork now and on the little, the, little, the bins, I don't know the bins or whatever, there, but there's these little paintings of Cork heroes. Keno is there and JBM is on a few of them as well. Like he's as respected as any hurler ever, isn't he? 
he is, and I mean, he looked the part, and the name was perfect as well. Uh, and he got some iconic scores for us, you know. And the fact that he played both was a sign of how good he was. He was brilliant. Do you think, Con, that the jewel, like, he was one of the great jewel players, and I don't know, he stuck with the hurling in the end, but he was as brilliant at the football as he was with the hurling. Like, are the days of jewel hurling football gone? At yeah. club level, no, I'm talking about a club level in Cork because I see it around me and I'm involved in clubs in Cork and I, it's very even difficult. It was the once upon a time where you the Sean Oaks that were able to do both at inter-county level. Teddy Mack won it in 1990. But yeah. at club level, now it's actually it's ridiculous. Like, well, do, you think club level is, do you think the dual player is totally dead? I do. It came home to me down in Tralee two or three years ago. I was doing doctor for the under-20s. And a Kerry man called me and he said, Kerry, Kerry, we're winning. Uh, he said, do you know the difference between the two teams? I said, go on, what's your theory? He said, you see the Kerry fellas, from the day they're born, they just play football. 100% football, night and day, school, everything. Do you see your fellas? Half of them are playing hurling and half of them are playing football all the time. And he puts that, and it is a good point, you know. Um, it, it, it's 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 too it's gone too too far today to be able to do the two. If, if I know it is a tough question, or it only bounce. The great days with Cork, where you really really remember, and you say, "Wow, that was was the nineteen ninety special in terms of what was achieved." Like, or have you a, a one particular moment with Cork, and you say? Whoa, take me back there again. I'll tell you about 1990. It didn't matter. The double didn't come into it for the footballers. Right? Say, the hurlers won a great All Ireland. But for the footballers, we we had to suffer badly to Mead. I mean, we beat, they beat us in 87, draw 88, beaten replay. You know, they had the whip hand on us. And, and there was... At that time, there was bad feeling between us, which has since been well corrected. We're great pals now. But uh, the whole thing in 1990 was to beat me, not to win the double. So th the double afterwards was a bonus. But I, I would say the, the, the match that gave me the most satisfaction was 2010. And yeah. fellas find that strange, but... You must remember, we had been humiliated a couple of times by E up in Crow Park. And there were a great bunch of fellas, and they had really trained hard and worked hard. And it looked like they might never get over the line. And if you remember, we were down at half time, uh, and we were lucky enough to get home afterwards. But I got great satisfaction from seeing that bunch of players winning all Ireland. Uh, Purely it's because of what it did. Crew, like, they won four national leagues, didn't they? They did. They, they should have won more All Ireland as well, Tomas, yeah. but they did well to win the it's one. Nice it one. With, me, with me living in Cork and having to face Cork in an All Ireland final, it would have been a hard place to work after. <laughs> <laughs> I could imagine, yeah. yeah. Was there oh, any. Yeah. Was there any low days, Con? Bad days? I'd like you know, that. How would you take as a doctor being connected? And I suppose you'd have the, the the fact that you loved and you knew how much it meant to that particular group to win. When Cork lost, would you be as hurt and as gutted with them, or was there any days that you said, "Geez, that's a bad day"? No, I, I would, but I get over it quick. You know, yeah. I didn't see it as life and death. Uh -huh. I used to feel sorry for the fellas, but you know, I, I recovered quick. You couldn't you couldn't last as long as I have in the job if it affected you. So that's probably why I've lasted. You're a huge family man, Con. I know uh, Kean and Brian and Colm and Joan, obviously your wife, and all of that. Like, and it, it's Colm is now the doctor of the Cart team, the hurlers. And how long, how long, have you, what year did you start in terms of your connection with the Cork GAA? 
and it's still continuing now with Colm going forward. So how long has the Murphy family been connected to, to Cork GA? Well, if you go back to my dad, just post-1942, I mean, when he started playing with Cork. Uh, and to the good tradition. There's I mean, a connection all the way since. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love the GA. I think it's a great way of life. And, uh, I mean, the friends and the contacts you make uh, and the way we look after each other really appeals to me. Of course, there's rivalry there, but at the end of the day, we don't leave, leave each other down when when they're in trouble. I often wonder how you make money because I'd say there was no student that passed through your door <laughs> and you're across the, gate, the road from college gates there that you ever charged in your life as a doctor, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't. There was well, a I lot of fellas that, that you passed through exams too, I'd say, Con, was there? <laughs> <laughs> I was known for giving them notes, all right. <laughs> One of the best stories that you ever told me was, and I'm not going to mention any family, but there was a family in Kerry, a big footballing family, our footballers, and then they were mad into it and they gave you a shout and they asked you, uh, back in the day when, when you could possibly do something about it, they said, Con, is, is there any chance he's only after getting or is there any chance he can get in and do this course down in Cork? And you said, how many points did he get? And they told you how many points he get, and it was obviously a lot lower than he should have been getting. And you said, he can do the gardening in the grounds of the college if he wants. That's <laughs> 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 no, I, I've loved the connection with Kerry and UCC. I mean, it's been great fun looking after them over the years. You know, make great pals out of it. One um, of the one of the and people don't know or realize the history that goes into college football and everything. And I remember one day, and I think this tradition is gone. On, and I'd say you would have seen a sure amount of this back in your day was managers coming into op- opposition dressing rooms, I don't know does it happen as much anymore and they talk and it's a very hard thing to do to come into a, a winning dressing room after you losing an All-Ireland final and Billy Morgan came in to us after 19, after 2000 and uh, whatever final was it 7 and came into our dressing room after we had won and the whole dressing room fell silent for him, of course. And it got emotional for him talking. But the connection was Dr. Dave Ganey. And the connection was the reason Billy came in was UCC connection. With Dave asked him, he said, will you come in and talk to the lads? And Dave didn't do it in any uh, other for any other reason, only for the respect that he had for Billy. But down the years, Con, I suppose you've seen that kind of stuff. Big managers from other counties coming in and talking. Is there a lot of the traditions of the GA that you think have gone that you say, Christ, that they were good, they should have held on to them? The, that's a good point. Well, <laughs> uh, when I was thinking of coming on the show, I was thinking one of the things I used to like to do was stand on the sideline and stare at the Kerry fellas that I was friendly with. I'd be winking at them and giggling at them to see could I distract them. <laughs> You, you, yourself and Gally used to look through me as if you were about to kill me. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't upset you. <laughs> we used to, um, uh, back in the day, the two of us and Gally, when he was in Cork in UCC, and he was teaching then for a while in Cork, uh, we used to meet in the gym and Gally used to have the, the tattoos. I never <laughs> was bit of laughing one day. You couldn't make out. It actually turned out that Paul had a Latin tattoo on his shoulder. And you said to me inside the dressing rooms, get him over, get him over near the mirror. I think that tattoo is a mirror trick that you can actually read it backwards in a mirror. I find out what it says. <laughs> so there we were, grown men behaving like children. And I trying to get Calvin over in front of the mirror. And you in the background, can't figure the fucking thing out. <laughs> Whereas I suppose when you take the whole thing as a full thing, Con, what I read is from you is the banter and the crack and the social side of it and the friends that you meet. That's the GA it means to you, like. It is. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, the trophies will be second, do you know. Uh, it's been well worth it. I mean, I have 
been involved in, I think, 13 All Ireland's the Cork one. Yeah. But I'd swap them all for the friendships and the, the fun I've had, you know. Yeah. But winning, of course, makes it much better. Yeah. Um, and you look forward to this year's championship and you'll keep going to the games. And I know oh, the COVID has been tough, but we, we'll, we'll see the other side of that as well. Um, how do you see, say, in terms of, of the championship this year and what Dublin are doing and what everybody else is doing? I was at a game a couple of weeks ago there where the crowds were very, very small. 200 inside in Parky Creel, 200 inside in Thurlis, 200 inside in Crow Park. And look, we've all gone through a tough time. Jesus, Khan, if they're allowing 200 into a, a, a concert in Killarney, which they are, how can you say that you can't allow more than 200 into what's your own? And I don't know your opinion. I haven't asked you well, about it. I couldn't agree more with you, Tomas. What you've written about it is dead right. I mean, it makes no sense to me to, to keep in the numbers as, as low as they are. I mean, by all means, control it. But there's, there's no sense to... The, the numbers they're they're green. The, the talking about myself the first time one of the first times I realized that I, I, I needed help. Um my problem was running on the pitch. It, that became a problem for me. But we were up in up in Dublin a few years ago playing uh, Dublin in the National League and Christopher Joyce did his crusade and I had to get the the mobile ambulance on the pitch to take him off. And the fellow driving it said, look, you have to get on it and come up, come with him to the first aid room. I was passing the hub and standing some, some, I'd say probably a buddy of mine roared out, did you call the ambulance for yourself? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I decided to try to be moving on. <laughs> <laughs> if there was some fellow injured on the far side of the pitch, you'd say, ah, he's all right, he's all right, he'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> the, only um, time I got, uh, the only time I got in trouble was uh, 87, Crow Park wrote to me and said, we were playing Mayo, said that I was coaching the team, not doing the medical stuff that I was running into coach, not <laughs> to explain what I was doing, so... <laughs> Uh, oh, one, there was one uh, as an opposition player, I suppose. You used to always think you used to always be nice to the referees, and that was our. We used to never fuck the referee out of it because we knew we might need him for a fucking old decision down the uh, later. Yeah, on the day. yeah, you were always good with the referees as well. Oh, yeah, I, I remember we were playing Kilkenny uh, a few years ago, and Wayne Sherlock had a belt, and I went into him, and. Uh, I think it was Zaydan was refing it and he came over. He said, How oh, is he? I said, Geez, that was a desperate belt he got Aidan. I said, You'll be in some trouble tonight with the Sunday game. What do you mean? Instead of telling me you get lost, he says, What do you mean? I said, Jesus, you're riding us. <laughs> <laughs> and got uh, Martin Comfort heard heard me he came over, he started pushing me. And I met him a few weeks later at Shannon Airport. We had some crack about it. We <laughs> uh, don't think, Khan, there's no... Like the one thing, I travel the country and I'd meet fellas and they'd always know that I'd be friendly with you and they'd always ask, how's, how's Khan? And uh, I think with, with your good buddies, with so many fellas around the country, um, and it was brilliant to see you getting honoured by your own city a couple of years ago and the big night that you had inside was phenomenal. Um, Okay, Con, thanks a million. Really enjoyed the chat, and I hope Cork do the business in the All Ireland final. I know it'll be a great finish to the year for you, and I suppose everybody in Cork will be hoping the same. Erboa, I'll talk to you soon, Con. Thanks again to our sponsor, Airgrid, proud supporters of the Airgrid Under 20 All Ireland Football Championship and leaders in Ireland's pursuit of a cleaner energy future. Don't forget to follow, subscribe, and review. Garamila Mahagar.